This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. This is our 13th podcast, and I'm today I'm chatting to the energetic Anna Kellerman, who's the chief mama and founder of Mama Creatives, a lively group that's based in Sydney but has a global vision. Four years after it began, Mama Creatives runs monthly masterclasses and special events designed specifically for women, many of whom are writers, designers, singers, and creative entrepreneurs, as well as parents. Anna Kellerman is passionate about the arts, kids, sharing, and connecting, and is an art educator and registered as a therapist. In fact, she has a master's thesis about the benefits of working with clay and children with anxiety disorders. Over the past decade, she has worked with kids and teens with a range of emotional and behavioural issues, most recently working with children from domestic violence backgrounds. We are delighted and honoured to have Anna on the show to canvas the politics of creative women. Welcome, Anna. Hello, Amber. Thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful podcast. I'm very excited to be here. It's so exciting to have you here. And obviously, we know each other in real life as well, but (laughs) um, podcasting is a fantastic medium to help you reach a wider audience. Yes. So we're going to start at the very beginning, maybe not the day you were born, (laughs) because I don't remember that, but your early life. Do you think that you were always born with a sense of creativity and a desire to be creative? That's such a good question. And I, I ask that question of all my presenters over the years. I think it's so telling where you're from and what background you have. And I do believe that we, we are all born creative. In fact, through my research as an art therapist, I came across a woman called Rhoda Kellogg. And she spent many years researching children's drawings. And she went around the world and overall analyzed a million children's drawings from every type of race and culture and creed. African, Asian, Caucasian, and she came up with these 20 universal visual symbols which all humans have. So we have this visual language before we even learn to have, before we learn to speak. So I think that if this is fostered and nurtured, yes, we are all creative because we have this way of expressing ourselves through symbols. Sure. So what about you? I mean, as a kid, did you always, did you love like singing and dancing or drawing? I mean, as a kid, what, what sort of your, some of your early memories of how you expressed yourself? As a child, I was very artistic, so I would always be drawing and, and creating things with my hands. So I was a visual artist, I guess. I, used to, I saw the world through in a, in a very visual way. When I look at things now and, and I remember as a child, I would see colours in a leaf. I would see the yellows and the the blue tones and I'd see whatever, the orange tones. I would just see this other palette within the world that I look at. And as a child, I was always, always drawing and creating. And my parents got divorced when I was three. And so there was a lot of turbulence in my in my childhood. Yes. And did you find creativity was a way for you to sort of, I guess, a bit of therapy in a way and perhaps, you know, sow the seeds for your later career? That's exactly right. That's what I was getting at. I think it was my way of exiting that world and going into my own space so I know what it's like to use my imagination and the power of expression to find a better place and I used to do that all the time and you'd always find me in the art room when I was in high school and as a child it it was all all that I did is just sitting around and drawing and creating things I remember I went into this art competition and I made these boxes and in the boxes were these shop fronts that I had made all these 3D outfits. It was in the 70s. There were boots and there were berets and there were long skirts. And and I spent hours and hours and hours of creating these out of little cardboards and paint and fishing wire. And I made these fashion shop fronts. And I loved that. So I would have ideas and then I'd work out ways to execute them. And I'm always, I'm still doing that. And I see my daughter doing that too. Oh, good. Well, the creativity gene has definitely gone through. And I suppose, you know, sort of fast forwarding a little bit, how did you decide career wise what you, what you wanted to do? Given the fact you were so creative, was it, was it, was it the idea always to be an artist and then obviously other things 
became of interest? How did you how did you decide? That's such a good question. Basically, I always wanted to be an artist, but I I always wanted to create and be a creative person. I didn't necessarily want to be an artist where I would have an exhibition and sell my work, although I had people asking me if they could buy my work, even as a child. One of my mother's friends wanted to be my patron and pay for all my artworks, but I didn't want to part with them and I didn't feel that was my my thing. I want. I was better as a conduit. I was better at supporting others and creating a space for them. So I did go to art school and I studied painting and fine arts and education, art education. And then I was really passionate about a, a career as an art in arts administration. For many many years, I wanted to be a curator, which is interesting. It's sowing the seeds for Mama Creatives. But I wanted to be a curator and I, I organized exhibitions and I, I brought all these people together and, and I loved doing that. I loved the multi-layered, multi-channeled aspect of curating all the different people, all the different artists, all the, the media. And I did that from a very young age, from my late teens. I did that on the side and I really thought that was my career and I worked at the SH Irvin Gallery and I worked at Biennale and I was given jobs, paid jobs from both of those places. And I just love that education aspect of it and I loved getting people together. I love the stories that came with sharing other people's artworks and I love the curiosity. I think being an artist is quite lonely and I used to spend hours and hours in my mother's garage and in my room painting on my own. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to say <laughs> you're very – um, you definitely have a uh, you know an ability to bring people together and I get a sense that you get energy and a bit of life and inspiration. Yeah. I like being on my own and you probably will be very surprised that I am actually more introverted than extroverted. But I think I, when I find my thing, I can't control myself and you won't know that I'm shy because when you're in the zone, you forget about all that. And after doing it for many years, you don't get shy. But I used to be very shy and so art to me was, was a retreat. But I also love that aspect of helping others and nurturing others and I think curating and, and a career in the gallery setting – was something that I wanted because there's energy and you, there's always constant learning and inspiration and ideas. And I think being on my own, although I never was short of ideas or, or give me a pad and paper, I will draw, you know, pencil and paper, I will draw something. Real life was always my, is always my, my canvas for inspiration. But the whole idea of curating and working in a gallery was something that I wanted to do. But then what happened was in my 20s, I thought, I'm, I'm okay, I know what I want to do. No problem. I have no problem understanding that. I will be patient. I'll do all the work. I'm sorted. I don't need to worry. And then one day I was at an art gallery opening for the Biennale and I just saw these two people kiss the air. They didn't kiss their cheeks. They literally kissed the air and it was really fake and superficial. And that moment just clicked in me and I'm, I just thought, I can't do it. I can't be I don't want to do art, art administration anymore. And I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> That's an amazing amazing how you remember that, that that was sort of that tipping point, if you like, for you to then perhaps think what else is out there that you could you could do for a career. It was really interesting. Look, I'm a Gen X, so for me, having a career and staying in one job forever it wasn't really what was happening in my generation and, and in those days. And so traveling was the biggest thing. So I went traveling for nearly three years. I just got my backpack. I started off in Africa and I went on all these safaris and I, I did all this stuff. I ended up in London and then I lived in Paris, which was always my dream as a teenager when I was studying the Impressionists in high school. We had a very Eurocentric curriculum. And for me, living in Paris and traveling and seeing the world was the best thing to, as a creative person because that's where inspiration is. That's where life engagement is and that's where everything comes together. That's where stories are. That's where I still draw inspiration just meeting people, there's so much that you can gain from traveling and I'm so glad that there were no mobile phones and no internet really back then where you could be on top of a mountain and write proper postcards and draw in the world and go on these adventures where no one knew where you were. So that was really formative for me and when I came back, my friends were just starting up this this research agency and they were really at the cutting edge of Back then, they were doing these CD-ROMs. Their name, they started Heartbeat, which no longer exists, but they were doing something that no one was doing. They were doing, taking research and putting it into a digital, digital format, which for people with social media now sounds like nothing, but at the time. Yeah, back then though, that was um, groundbreaking. Even you describing it, I can picture what that would have been like. It was and, groundbreaking um, and, and they needed someone to find their quotes. They used to call me the quote factory. Basically, I used to watch hours and hours of their groups. They used to talk to people about all different social issues and themes. 
And they broke them down into different categories of, you know, mums and dads and the literati, which were the people in their 20s and teens and kids. And they broke up these – it was a little bit like humor Kai but way more edgy and way more fun and way more accessible. And I used to watch hours and hours of these groups and they used to ask me to find quotes to fit certain themes. And then over time – I was watching all their groups and I would come back to them and say, you've missed this whole other area. Here are some more themes. And I would create more analysis for them. I would understand the data and give them back extra. So they yes. then, op- then, I then I then got a job in that, in that world. So I became a researcher in qualitative research and it was more commercial. I worked for fast moving, you know, it's a different types of research than social research. And yeah, so I spent 18 years as a researcher. Wow. And I guess the idea that you then sort of came about into the world of art therapy and working with children rather than maybe corporates and adults, how did that sort of come about in a nutshell, in a brief way? You know. So what happened then was I was working in research and I was working full-time in research and I felt I became a consumer manipulator and I felt it, it was just making me feel a bit sick the way that I would get people to share their stories for the greater good of a corporation that maybe I didn't truly felt was ethical. So when I was 31, I sat up in bed one day and thought, I'm going to do art therapy. I'd been wanting to do it since my first degree. I I went to, to College of Fine Arts and did a Bachelor of Art Education. And in that degree, I was introduced to art therapy. So 10 years later or 15 years later, I thought this is the time to finally do that course. So I moved to Melbourne and I went and enrolled in, I got into the master's course at La Trobe, which is very hard to get into and a very, very difficult course that you have to be exposed to everything. You're very vulnerable and you have to understand all your triggers before you become a therapist. And I I did a thousand hours of clinical training. I spent two years working with kids and teens in this clinic. And I also started my own agency. So I kept up my market research So to pay for it all. So I paid for my master's as I went, cost $30,000. And I basically was working seven days a week. I was doing my agency work, staying up overnight to finish these commercial presentations. And then I'd go and work yes. with kids and I'd also go to uni and do my course. And I was very passionate about both. But the art therapy was something that I remain passionate about and it's something that I feel can make a big difference. And I also have the understanding about the power of, of being a good therapist with the right setting and how it can help children going through difficult times, probably from my own experience, but also from my vast training. Absolutely. So in a way, like, you know, being creative as well as obviously having this cognitive side to you, which Mm. um, obviously being able to do a master's and all the other things that you achieved, how did you then decide, okay, that's something that I'm I'm kind of happy with for now and then you've got your Mama Creatives that evolved. I mean, I, I, I'm curious to know how exactly you started Mama Creatives. <laughs> that, again, it was something organic like most things. I think things come at you in your life when you're ready to handle them or they come at you when you're open and aware and you see an opportunity and it's not an opportunity at the time. It's just something that feels right. And I'm a curious person. I just follow my nose. And what happened was I had been living in, in Spain where I had my daughter, my husband is Spanish, and I came back from Spain and because my daughter was born there, I didn't have a mother's group in Sydney, came back to live in Sydney when she was seven months old and I didn't have a mother's group and I didn't have any of that foundation that I think people, Australian women get when they give birth. Well, they do. They put you in. They one, put really. you in one. I don't know. I didn't have that experience. So yeah, no, I mean, they do. They kind of put you on in one. And of course, you don't always gel with everyone, <laughs> but you do have a framework, and you've got people to meet up with who are going through something similar, who've right. got babies at the same age. So I yeah. think, like anything in life, just because you're a mother doesn't mean you're going to like each other. So what happened was, I have a lot of friends still in Sydney, even though I've been living in Melbourne and Spain. I still have this amazing group of close friends in Sydney. And I've also, I met some other friends through my daughter's preschool. It was a very creative preschool. And one day I met one of the mums who lived across the road from me and we got talking and she's this incredible sculptor and kinetic mobile sculptor. Her name's Jade Oakley and she's an incredible artist and we just got talking and she just seemed quite isolated and was going through a hard time with her second child and she shared all this stuff with me and she's a very humble and not necessarily an open person but she shared all this stuff with me and it just seemed that she needed someone who understood her and we used to chat a lot and it came to a point where all in one week other friends of mine had felt a sense of isolation or a sense of not despair but something was missing. 
they didn't seem they had the same luster that they had before they had kids. They were all going through hard times. Their kids were quite young at the time. And I just had this idea of bringing them together. And so we met in the local park and it was electric. And what happened was there were maybe six or seven of us and not everyone got around to speaking to everyone because they just once they spoke to one person, they were locked in that conversation. They were dynamic. And then afterwards they said, I wish I could have met that artist or that filmmaker. She seemed really interesting. So then I came home and I was really pumped and I wrote this manifesto, which I think scared a few of them off. (laughs) They were like, whoa, I was like, we've got to do this. This is really exciting, blah, blah, blah. So I wrote this full-on manifesto and I wrote a whole and we decided to, instead of meeting in the park as a mother's group, to put the spotlight or the focus back on the mum so she could share her story so we wouldn't have the same thing happen each month. So we decided to have a monthly meeting. First one was in someone's house and Jade was the one who presented her story and her body of work, which raised the bar very high because she did a PowerPoint presentation. She made it very professional to show all her artwork because it's such large scale. It was the only way that we could see her. Yeah, you couldn't do show and tell, I guess. And then at the end of it, well, she did bring some stuff in and then at the end of it we used to, we were a small group and we had young kids, so we used to have a little workshop at the end where she showed us how to make little mobiles. So in the first instance, we used to, there were six or eight of us, and each month a different person presented their story and their body of work, and it was very grassroots. We then, I found, I went down to the Bondi Pavilion where they gave us a room for like $30 for two hours, and we'd have all our kids running around, and and we'd have this very, very old projector against a disgusting, dirty wall, and we loved it. I used to bring a jug down and some biscuits, and we used to sit there and listen to these stories that were Ted-worthy, and there would only be a few of us. And it was incredible. It was an incredible opportunity for these mums to connect with their identity. And I just loved it. I think I think all the things that I've done all my life were all brought together for this particular community. It was all the things that I've enjoyed, supporting others, nurturing others' creativity, doing some creative task at the end. And it seemed meaningful, authentic. And I saw these women change and come to life. They weren't looking tired or nervous or anything. They came to life. Yes. And I think that's the thing. I mean, I, I just, just to kind of cut in there, just the idea that I guess from my own experience too, you know, often as a, as a new mom, you know, you had this whole adult life and then you have this little person and you lose a lot of your energy and even the time, really literally the time to explore maybe some creative hobbies or interests or connections. So I think what you've touched on is really poignant because I think a lot of particularly mums and probably dads too um, in a way, but especially because you're working with women and mothers, you do lose a little bit of that. So I think anything that can help you get that, get your groove back is um, is worthwhile. And I think it's about giving yourself, it was two hours a month, giving two hours a month to talk about yourself and your work and to feel a sense of achievement. And there's nothing wrong about that. And I'm, I'm very much about disrupting mother guilt because, you know, you're not a bad mother if you spend some time on yourself. It doesn't mean... You don't need to be 24 hours a day unless, you know, they're newborns. And I, you know, I spent probably a year and a half just looking at my my daughter when she was born and when she was little. I spent all this time with her. But I think you're a better mother when you're doing something fulfilling. And what can happen is over time, if you don't do that thing that you enjoy, you become more of a shell of yourself over time. And then you forget what it is that you enjoy. So I think, you know, Mama Creatives is not just for women who have young children. That's sort of how it started. But I had women coming along to those first sessions where their kids were older, their kids were in primary or high school, and they loved it too. It was It's more about the philosophy and being around women who you just gel with. We don't necessarily talk about motherhood. I think it's the intellectual and the creative conversations and the magic that happens in the room when you get these people together, which I think is the is what brings us together. What? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's right. I think it's just you fostering what's there amongst the women but bringing it maybe to the forefront and allowing some of those barriers which we put, those social kind of conditions. Of barriers. Of That's right. What mother looks like and what she does and how she spends her time. Right. You're breaking that down and I think that. It's none of that. You know, over time since those early sessions to, to now and, and I'm still moving forward, I'm learning as I go and, and I always get ideas when I see other things happening and I, I think that will be a great thing that we can do, etc. But I think I think the early the, the way it started was that I saw these women. There was a light that was that just appeared in them, and then since those early talks, pretty much every mum that was maybe stuck has gone on to become what they wanted to be. They've all found success in their creative careers. 
And that's amazing. So what's your vision for, for what for Mama Craves? It is four years on and I think um, you, you're doing amazing things with your regular workshops and masterclasses and, and community building activities. I mean, what's what's the bigger plan? Well, it's interesting. Well, the first two years were just these friends. It wasn't anything. It was, there was no Facebook page. There was no website. It's only been two years where I really made it into what it is now and what it's becoming. Those first two years was me just going around my friends and giving everyone an opportunity. <laughs> and I was desperately afraid that if we stopped doing them that we'd run out of friends in the group that's why I opened it up to the broader community and and I continue on that path I think being a researcher I'm curious about people and I never get sick of stories as a qualitative researcher in the corporate world I've I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds I wouldn't even know how many hundreds of people and I've done literally facilitated hundreds and hundreds of groups so you know I don't get bored of meeting people I think the future for Mama Creatives is traveling the world and finding as many interesting stories as I can and creating this opportunity online for people to connect because we can't all come to the one venue and creating this resource. I think the beauty of online now is it's, I mean, I love face-to-face. It's definitely my preferred way to get together with people, but the realities of geography Mm. and um, other time constraints means that I suppose for something like Mama Creatives, you could have an online presence and people could still feel very much part of it. Yes, so we film our talks. So, you know, we have this membership and people can, you know, get access to all our talks. But I like the live. So we started, we're every different. We started live and we're going online where I think a lot of people do the opposite. You know, my my favorite podcast is The Moth, themoth.org, and they've been running for 20 years now, and they, they started with these live events, and they're online. You can hear them online as well. And people don't get sick of storytelling. I mean, storytelling is a very popular word right now, so I don't think I will ever get sick of interesting stories and mums doing interesting things. I'm very interested now in exploring that more. So this year in November, we're going to do our first story slam. Instead of a Christmas bash, we're going. I'm going to run this story slam where I'm inviting mums from the community to share an interesting story in related in, in relation to the theme, which will be courage. And instead of having one speaker, we'll have several from the community sharing a, a little anecdote. And I want to see how that goes. So I think uh, you know this storytelling aspect will be something that I might continue to do and find ways to support the mums in learning how to craft their stories because I think at the moment. I have these evening talks, the Creative Mama evening talks, and I help a lot of the mums with their stories and I'm somehow, I guess, writing all those presentations and market research has helped me understand and outline and how to make that happen. But I yes. think that's something that I like to do on a bigger scale. Like the Moth and I guess like TED Talks, it's, it's a similar idea, isn't it, where we run these community workshops and we just help people, we give people skills. I think mums can kind of fall through the cracks a little bit creative mums I, I agree and I think I think what you're doing is powerful because we don't talk about creativity and I think I know you do a lot of business related work with entrepreneurs and creative souls in that capacity but I think there's a lot of not a lot of support but there is there is some support for women who are perhaps in that business world there's a lot of those groups but there's not that other side to bringing out your creativity that's kind of encouraged so I think it's quite unique and different what Mama Creative stands for. It's not trying to be another, you know, corporate female entrepreneur group or business group, even though there are a lot of business minded and successful women, however you define success in, in Mama Creative. So mm. I, I think that's all down to who you are and what you've brought together. Thank you. Um, I'm always a big believer in, you know, you never do this stuff on your own and you don't have to name them, but are there any mentors <laughs> or inspirational figures that you kind of always refer to in your own in your own life or your own business well you know the first core group of mums who started this with me who came who came to every event um you know I think Jade Oakley has been there by my side she's gone off and she's spending a lot of time on her career right now but you know there were a few mums in that first group yeah Ellie Ohana is an artist she was in that group Dominica Ferenz she's a filmmaker she was in that group so they're my if I really need people to help I call on them. Sarah Garden is a photographer. She's Fantastic photographer. She um, she's a, I met her through you and she did my photos, yes. which included what yeah. I used for the Politics of Everything podcast. So I think, yeah, thank you for that introduction. I think the women in my community give me so much inspiration. Yourself, you've been a masterclass presenter. I meet so many great people through this platform and before I started Mama Creatives. So I'd say all my presenters and all the people in the community, I draw a lot of energy and, and support and inspiration from them. Joanne Fedler is an incredible writer. I, I, I ask her for guidance sometimes. 
I had a business mentor some, and I still seek her guidance sometime, Kim McGuinness. She used to run Network Central. Now she's running Mentor Central. She's fantastic because she spent 16 years running events and also an online uh, mentoring program. And she, I asked her to be my mentor the day she had, she hosted her last event. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're right. I think that that's the caliber of women that, you know, there's, there is a, a real connection there amongst all your presenters and and obviously the community at large. So to wrap up, because it, it's unbelievable, but we're almost uh, at the end of, <laughs> end of the session. You've got me talking about all my favorite oh, topics. No, you've been fantastic, and I think the audience will really value what you're saying and relate to it in so many ways. If you could sh- close off by, I guess, sharing your manifesto in a, in a complex <laughs> way, you know, if listeners are out there thinking, well, how can I tap into this female creative energy? What would be maybe a couple of top tips for you as we close off the politics of creative women? Good question. I would say give yourself some time, some stillness to connect with that thing that you loved doing as a kid, not what you wanted to be, just that thing that made you happy. I think you're right. I think you're right. That that stillness, that quietness, we are in a, such a busy, connected, digital world. A bit of stillness can actually uh, inspire you, I think. Find that thing and see what comes to you. It may not come straight away. I guess it's a, it's a type of meditation thing. I don't do meditation, but I do meditative type activities all the time. I find washing up. I don't have a dishwasher. So I wash up and I look out the window. I have a really great view of the ocean, so I'm lucky. And all my ideas come when I'm doing something like that. So... I think connect with the thing that you'd love to doing. If you're feeling a little bit lost or you're feeling unfulfilled or there's something missing, find the time to connect with that thing and then find the time to do it, I would say, 10 minutes a week. Don't pressure yourself. And that could be writing in a journal. It could be drawing. It could be using your kids' craft materials, whatever it is. Action that. Action that feeling. That's the way to start. I think that's fantastic advice. And if anyone does want to connect further with with Anna Kellerman, we will have her details and Mama Creative's website details in our show notes. We have been enjoying her company on the politics of everything. I'm Amber (laughs) Taines. And until next time, keep well and don't forget to do something creative even for 10 minutes today. Thank you so much, Anna, for your time. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network, your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.